let's do this the German way. Right? You know, <laughs> we are an international association, but punctuality is of the essence. Uh, you all have a lot to do and we have a limited time. So welcome everybody. This is the Liquid Legal Institute call on uh, legal in-house KPIs from input to impact. Uh, this event is associated with the white paper that we uh, have published and some of the co-authors of this white paper we have with us today and some more people who will be participating in a panel discussion, uh, which we're all looking forward. But before I introduce all of them, a word on the business etiquette, we have um enable the chat function so all of you who want to say something or ask questions please do so in writing use the chat function and uh, then bernard and evgeny will uh, uh, support me in kind of integrating uh this uh your statements into discussion which i will be moderating moderating uh, on on the lli's behalf my name is roger um and uh this also being said, uh, we do not expect you to participate verbally, so uh, please refrain from raising your hand and uh, if you have something to contribute, please do so in writing and we'll, we'll integrate it. All right, uh, that much for the introduction and now according to the agenda, we'll start by hearing what it even is that is in the book. You know, what, what, what is the content of this book, Legal In-House KPIs from Input to Impact and we have two co-authors with us, uh, Bernard Bartel, one of our co-CEOs at the LLI, and also Mike Ebersol, who is the head of legal operations at Robert Bosch GmbH. And I'll just hand it over to both of you guys to lead us into the world of metrics and KPIs. And hopefully it's not going to be boring all about numbers. So make it interesting. <laughs> Thank you very much, Roger. Uh, thanks for this kind introduction. And we did our best uh, not to make this topic uh, boring. Um, we titled this presentation, which should give you a brief insight into the white paper that we at the Liquid Legal Institute were working on for the last couple of months uh, by data-driven legal departments, an introduction into metrics and KPIs. So we all see a huge discussion going on on how does the future of legal in-house look like? How does the future of legal profession look like? And we all agree, um, at least that's what we see between the lines and also openly discussed, that many of us are focusing on the, a future that is what we call data driven. So we do see that the relevancy for data, for information, for technology will increase and thereby metrics and KPIs, so-called key performance indicators, will play an essential role. And this is why we at the Liquid Legal Institute um, decided to take up this topic and said, what, what if we start in this discussion, we want to lead this discussion and we started uh, by creating and contributing a white paper. The white paper was done by the Liquid, Le Liquid Legal Institute, which served as the neutral and non-profit platform. But obviously the Liquid Legal Institute is nothing without its members. And in this particular project, it would have been nothing without the great project team that was contributing and that, would, that was collaboratively working on the white paper. Here is an overview of the eight main authors. It's Mike, Nina, Sean, Dirk, Maurus, Peter, Jan, and myself. Um, we do have, a, we come from various backgrounds. We all have our relationship to a legal in-house department, the one way or the other. I am personally, I'm not a lawyer, for example. I do have an informatics, a computer science background, but others are lawyers, so they do see how legal um, in-house departments are working on a daily basis. They also seen, also from a historical point of view, how things have changed in the last couple of years. And they are, um, I think, a very strong project team that was really able to uh, contribute significantly to the ongoing uh, discussion. I'm more than happy to represent or on behalf of the project team, give you a, some insights on only a few slides. We don't want to put too much F, um, focus on, on the content of the paper now. The paper, by the way, is freely available on the web. You can download it. We will post the link where you can find it on the web page uh, in the chat. We also have a QR code later on in the presentation. Feel free to, it, to have your mobile phone ready um, and um, to make a, um, a picture and download the, the PDF document. There is no password protection. There is no paywall. So also feel free to contribute, discuss, and also to distribute it among your, your legal team or your, among your communities where you're engaged. After a couple of slides, I will hand over to Mike, who will um, 
like the rest of the presentation. And then finally, uh, not later than 15 to 20 minutes, like an appetizer, we hand back to Roger to moderate and lead the moderation uh, for the remaining hour. So here's the first QR code. Pick your mobile phones, um, scan it, uh, open the, the the PDF. What we have prepared here for you are three main or three screenshots that summarize the introduction or the, the first part uh, of the white paper. It is the cover. You should recognize it once you open it. Um, <clears throat> also the list of authors with the affiliations and also a brief overview of the contents. Obviously, we do not have the time to go into each and every chapter and section of the white paper in greater depth. But we really want to highlight that this paper is not only about number crunching, it is not only about how to create and how to calculate on KPIs and metrics, because during the discussions that we had, and I can only um, um, state that it was great, we had great discussions, very enlightening discussions. I think we will come back to that later on. But we realized that speaking about data information, metrics and KPIs, so speaking about the future of legal departments, about a data-driven legal department, it is not only about number crunching, it is not only about um, creating numbers and creating dashboards and visualizations, it is really about comp comprehensively think about what needs to be done in order to prepare a legal department for metrics and KPIs. And this is what we try to cover within the white paper. Um, and this is also what I'm going to speak about in the next couple of slides. We need to have a common understanding when we speak about data, about information, about metrics and KPIs, uh, much more content obviously uh, contained in the white paper. But we also need a process of how to come up with KPIs in legal departments. Um, and there we will also see that the calculation of KPIs is only a minor or a small part of this whole process when it comes really to create or to transform a legal department into a data-driven one. And then Mike will tell us a little bit about what to measure and how to um, use metrics to measure performance and what this could actually mean. Well, why should we actually measure? Um, I guess there are many reasons and there are many organization specific reasons. Um, we try to collect um, the main reasons that we found. Um, and here we do have a highlight or some focus on a couple of those reasons that you'll find uh, which are currently discussed uh, in, the, in the public. So we do see a discussion on the measuring the performance and the effectiveness of a legal department. Um, there is also a discussion on the prioritization of legal resources and an understanding of where legal resources are needed. So it seems as if there's a lack of transparency of where all our re legal resources are going to. Um, there are metrics and KPIs discussed focusing on the effectiveness and the efficiency of specific methods or measures, um, also the transparency of the internal workload and the legal spend. It's about efficiency management and the processes that make us efficient or that also um, hinder us for, from being efficient. Um, KPIs are used to steer and to support decision making and many, many more reasons. And I guess once we would start the discussion now, uh, you can, could came up with your own story why we should start measuring. Um, so we really see that we um, that there are many different reasons <clears throat> and those reasons can be manifold. Um, you will find, as said, many more um, content or much more content in the paper. Speaking about KPIs and metrics, we realized that there is not a common terminology. So actually, when we start discussing data, information, metrics, and KPIs, and all these, let's, let's call them words and phrases that are, that are around in, in, in the area, we do see that there is no common understanding. What do we actually mean when we speak about metrics? What do we mean when we speak about KPIs? We refer to a, a model that is well known in information theory and information science that specifies that at the bottom level there is data, which refer to raw values, everything that um, can, be, can be observed or that is automatically observed or recorded or tracked or locked using systems. Um, these, this, this data can be aggregated and processed, then we get information. We do get data in context, which gives, which gives us insights. Um, this is analyzed data, can be used in aggregations and reports. And then ultimately, of course, we want to further semantically enhance the information up to actions, meanings, and also semantics, which 
will give us the knowledge and wisdom such that we can effectively and efficiently steer and also fulfill our, our needs that, that we hopefully previously defined. And this comes or brings to me to a topic that is very close to my heart. It is about processes. Um, we do see that there is the need for KPIs and metrics to be discussed in a process, in, in a workflow, uh, because KPIs and metrics never come isolated. They are always, let's say, packaged into a, into a framework. And we identified three main phases. We said there is one preparation phase, there is an implementation phase, and there is a derivation phase for KPIs and metrics. These three blocks can be, can be made transparent, so it can be made to a white box, and we do see a, a more fine granular process uh, lying underneath. Um, and please forgive me that, again, I cannot go too much into, into depth, uh, but you will find all the, the text and the description in the white paper. So we do see the preparation phase with four steps, the implementation phase with four steps, and also the preparation phase with four individual steps. And you see that the there is one step that, that tells, well, calculate your KPIs. And this is one minor step. Um, within this whole chain that starts with clarify your objectives and the purpose of your KPI project and derive your hypothesis. So we really emphasize that it is not only uh, sufficient to get some data that you find somewhere on some database and you derive something, you define your, your metric and then you create some, 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 some numbers out of it and you use this then to manage and to efficiently steer your um, your legal department, but really start with what do you want to do? What, where do you want to start with? And what are your hypotheses? And then go into discussion, define what data do you need to derive and to, the, um, to answer and to tackle those hypotheses. Um, and then be also uh, sure about the data quality. Um, are you, can you ensure that the data is representative, that is sufficient, um, that also that you do not lack of specific data? And then you can calculate your KPIs and finally um, be sure that you evaluate your KPIs and also your satisfaction on that. Be honest to yourself and then restart the process and improve. So, it's, so the process is an iterative process that should take you by the hand and should lead you to your first successful KPI project. Having said that, um, as said, this was only a glimpse of what is contained in the, in the document, and I would kindly hand over to my dear colleague, Mike, to finalize the presentation. Thanks, Bernard. Um, I think it's really important to follow this process because in our discussions, we found a lot of examples where people are simply, yeah, they say we're interested in KPIs, but then at the end of the day, they're combining some randomly taken numbers and metrics and then they wonder why this does not fit to the real life and to the targets they are really pursuing. So it's really important to follow the process steps that uh, that I just described uh, on the last slide. Uh, when it comes to performance, um, so we thought about what does it typically mean? I mean, most of uh, most of the people out there have a very vague understanding what it means, but uh, do not apply a real uh, definition. And that's why we started started with the definition of uh, performance and. Uh, we found that typically it refers to a relation between input and output, so in very broad terms. And then again, we looked at these terms and we found, oh, it's not that simple. Maybe we need to be more granular. And then we said, okay, let's make, uh, as, an, as an example, let's take these five steps that you see on the screen now. So we all have some resources that are available to us. Uh, this is what we what we use uh, to initiate our, our daily work. It might be money, it might be um, uh, hours of our lawyers, it might be lawyer time, it might be a computing power of a, of, a, of, a, of a server or data center, whatever it is. And uh, again, it comes back, back to the process that Bernard just described. Uh, think about what you want to control and change, and then you, you know how you need to measure the, the resources. Um, and then the next question is, what do we use these resources uh, for? So what are the activities uh, that we undertake? What, are, what is the work that we actually do? Where do we spend our time? And that falls into the second uh, category. Um, and maybe Bernard, it's, it's worth going to the next slide because then we will at the same time see some uh, examples. 
And as you see, there are many ways to to measure the things that we do uh, within our office. When, uh, and uh, but again, uh, this is only half the way. Uh, then the next level would be what we refer to as output. So uh, we also could refer to this as first level results because we will see in a few seconds there will be second level results and third level uh, results on top of that. But let's start with the output with the first level results. So these are the direct uh, results of our activities. So the things that uh, that come out of our work. So maybe we use some time to review a contract. So the reviewed contract might be a result. Or imagine that we used our time to train the sales force on the latest uh, sales contract template. So the legal training that we delivered, this might be a uh, uh, a direct output um, of our work. But again, I mean, is it really what, what we care about in terms of performance? Maybe we do not care about the, the trained uh, sales representative, but we more care about, did he really learn something? Can he apply it? So now we are going to the next level uh, of output, uh, which would be the outcome. Uh, so this would be the second level results. And now we come closer to, um, Closer to the to the real um, to the real things that we wanted to achieve within the in the legal department, and um, very often the outcome is not necessarily defined from a pure legal perspective, but it includes a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, customer perspective. Because I mean, it's from the customer's point of view where they say, okay, yeah, this really is helpful. Uh, this helps me in my uh, my daily work, and. Even more so if we go to the impact, which is the third level results. Um, here again, we are looking at what's really what's really left uh, after we have uh, performed our services. What's what's the impact? What's the value we con contributed? And uh, if you're here between the lines, what I'm seeing, you see already that it might be a little bit difficult to differentiate between outcome and impact, uh, and during our discussions, we found a lot of um, pros and cons, and, and you don't need to make it that complicated. Maybe it's sufficient for you to say, OK, I have direct output, and then I have this uh, long-term impact, which is the real value I contributed to my company. But there might be a situation where it's worth doing this, in the, uh, this step in between and talking about output, outcome, and impact. And if we now look at um, the difference between, for example, the output and the impact, you see that the first one is more, um, it's more uh, operative. It's not that long term, it's more short term. And, uh, but the real thing, uh, if we talk about performance, uh, you can't answer the question for performance by looking at one of these uh, uh, individually, but now we need to combine it. And now I come back to my initial statement that performance, yes, it seems to be some relation about the input and the, the, the output. So um, now we could combine, for example, the resources the, that we have feed into this process with the output that we, that we uh, achieve. And um, as we said, output is more uh, uh, operative things than the performance measurement that you will get. Of course, it gives you an information about your operative performance. Performance. So, how expensive, for example, uh, how expensive is it to read one, uh, to review one contract, or to do one training, or things like that? If we now look about the relation between resources and impact, which is more the long-term view, the value that the legal department uh, contributed, it's a completely different meaning. But now, because now we come to the strategic value uh, at that uh, legal department can bring to the table. Because um, here we have more of these long-term implications uh, from a business point of view. And this might be completely different things. I mean, most of the companies we work for are driven by monetary terms. We want to earn money. So, I mean, we as lawyers, we, we need, to, uh, need to accept the fact that our long-term long value impact is measured in monetary uh, units. So not a surprise to that. And... Um, but I mean, you might be in another company where other things are more relevant, and then the the impact uh, will be measured in other categories than uh, uh, than money. But it's important to understand that there's not one key performance indicator, but it depends on the 
level of the form performance that you want to look at. And now coming back to uh, Bernard's process slide, uh, if you want to improve your operative processes, the way you uh, you do certain things, then maybe you need to look more on a on a uh, relationship between resources and work and output. But if you're looking at the long term uh, Im impact and the value add that you are contributing to the to the to the company as a whole, then maybe it's worth looking at uh, relations between uh, resources and work and then the impact. So that's uh, that's important to understand. And uh, so that's one of the uh, important uh, uh, findings that we that we had in our uh, conversations in the project group. Yeah. That's everything I had to say to this slide. Maybe let's go to the to the next one. Yeah, I think the the first bullet point is the most important one. Uh, you already hear it between the lines. I mean, it's all only a starting point. We had very interesting uh, discussion discussions on this, and uh, there's much more to discover. But um, what we really found is that uh, um, it's really worth um, using uh, metrics and using KPIs because. Uh, only talking about these things and defining these things and trying to measure it, this uh, brings you in a situation where you need to think about it. You you will not be able to apply the fussy terms that we have in our everyday language, but when you really want to quantify the numbers, you really need to find it very sharply. And this process of defining a thing is a very valuable thought process as such that uh, is uh, really worth uh, the time that it to spend. And having said that, I hand over to Roger. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Thank you very much, Bernd, as well. Uh, interesting stuff. I'm sure lots of topics to discuss, but instead of referring to you directly, we chose a different path. We decided to invite three uh, industry leaders to have a panel discussion. I'm sure we'll go back to what you've just presented. But uh, let me first introduce our panelists. My great pleasure to, um, first of all, introduce Mark A. Cohen, whom actually I haven't even seen right up to now. Is he even here? I'm here. You are here. Okay, I haven't seen your picture. Mark, good to hear your voice, and you'll be we'll be talking soon. Mark, is, here you are in full life color. Uh, you are the CEO of uh, Mosaic, um, Legal Mosaic, which is a legal business consultancy company providing strategic advice to uh, legal departments and law firms. We have secondly with us Sebastian Köhler. Uh, so I hope he's with us as well. As you know, like at 100 people, I haven't seen all the images, but Sebastian, here you are. Great to see you. Is the general counsel and executive vice president at Grünenthal Group, which is a pharmaceutical company uh, focusing on uh, pain um, management and related diseases. Great to have you on board. And we have with us Valerie Santo. She is the head of the legislation division at the European uh, Central Bank. So great to have you on board. Looking forward to the discussion. Uh, I will start or I will ask one introductory question to each of you so you can get off your mind what you want to say in a kind of initial statement, kind of like in a court session. I'll make you an initial statement. And then hopefully we will have a free floating discussion uh, where we will just maybe refer to what we've heard in the book and refer to each other. And like I said, the audience is called upon to participate via the chat. Uh, Bernard and Evgeny will read things out to us and then we can integrate that. Mark, let me start with you uh, because I have to say we spoke earlier and I was very impressed by one of the things that you told me. Uh, you told me that during your time as a litigation lawyer, when you uh, had prepared your opening statement, you would go out on the street and you would talk to a random person and say, listen, here, I give you $20 and all you have to do is listen to what I have to say and then report back to me, tell back to me what, what you've heard me say. And frankly, I still think this is an ingenious move of finding out how people perceive what you have in your mind and getting kind of an objective feedback on what they heard, which might be different from what you intended to say, right? So, and and I thought it was great. And it made me think that in some way, this book, this white paper that we're publishing might be the first step of this process, namely that uh, we were trying to help legal departments to first of all, have a story, to develop a story, kind of like an initial statement, something that you want to say that you can share with 
your your uh, internal clients, so purchasing and 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 sales departments, or with the board. Uh, is is that a way, Mark, at which you perceive this topic, KPI, metrics, and legal departments as well, or what what is your take on the topic? Well, first of all, Roger, thank you for invoking that long ago uh, uh, process that I had when I was a bet the company trial lawyer. And um, I, I would add one other point, which will become relevant in a moment to your question. Um, it was in, I, I would, uh, uh, $5, uh, pardon me, uh, five minutes was the entire process of which I would give my opening statement as it were in two minutes and then the uh, listener would have three minutes to tell me what she or he thought I was talking about. Um, that is a way of preparing um, for knowing whether or not you can communicate complex ideas very succinctly in a voice that is um, going to be clearly understood to um, the listener um, who is speaking a different language than we lawyers. Um, now let's analogize it to the matter at hand in terms of KPIs and metrics. Um, there is nothing, as we all know, inherently um, uh, valuable about a metric for a metric's sake. There is nothing that is inherently value with a KPI. Um, it's like evidence. Only a scintilla of evidence that is produced during uh, discovery or you know, this sort of investigative stage of litigation ever reaches the light of day. In fact, a recent uh, a, a study I found concluded that only one one hundredth of one percent, let me repeat that, one one hundredth of one percent of discovery um, is ever admitted into evidence. Um, so what does that say? It says that um, just as with evidence, uh, when we talk about metrics, when we talk about KPIs, what really matters is um, what is it that we are focused on? Um, is it relevant to the outcome or is it not? Is the you know, sort of performance that we are tracking relative to problem solving from the customer perspective as opposed to the lawyer perspective? So um, um, one of the things that makes said that particularly grabbed my attention was I think that we as a, a as a profession and more broadly as an industry have to focus less on what lawyers have traditionally thought was important and much more on what business and customers and clients think is important because we are in an age of fundamental change and digital transformation. Business is far along in this process. So if you were to show this very thoughtful survey to a business person, they would say, well, that's all well and good, but we've been doing that for, you know, 50, 60, 70 years. Um, you know, uh, so law is very behind and late to the party. Um, and so I'm delighted by this study. I think it is a wonderful first step. Um, and I underscore what has already been underscored, but I say it one more time with feeling, this is a great start, but it is only just beginning to scratch the surface. Excellent, Mark. So many things resonate, I'm sure, with all of, of, of us, what you said about the importance of business. Great start. Sebastian, let me move on to you. Uh, we only spoke once before in preparation of this call, and you said, uh, I'm happy to tell you the general counsel's perspective. So let's do exactly that. Please give us the, the GC's perspective on this topic of metric and KPI, and maybe answer one more question. Uh, uh, why, why, why does it come up now? Is there something, you know, why is this topic more relevant today than it was before? What's happening? I guess, I guess, and thanks, Roger. And, and also thanks, Mark, for already giving 100% uh, of my own speech, because obviously it's it's not we are late to the party, but it's very, it takes us longer to convince ourselves that this is obviously part of it. And it's all about focus. And actually it's, <laughs> it's now because we are quite late to the party. So um, I guess when we talk about KPIs and why would the general counsel be interested in those things, it's a currency in management. And uh, if you want to talk business to people, if we want to position ourselves, legal departments, general counsel and, and leaders in those discussions, and if you come up then and said, we are now there guys, we also understood, 
then you need to be warmly welcomed by the people who are far away with that digital journey they are already on. They can you you talk to, to you talk to procurement. They tell you what they did wrong in the past based on their wrong KPIs. They are able. They are already progressed and have a learning phase behind them. Now we start to have those discussions. We start to convince ourselves that it's important to be measured. To me, it's a leadership tool, and it's nicely laid out in the paper as well. Now, when I start, what is important for my team? When I start, very precisely, I want to be compared to other departments, yeah, not in the industry, in my organization. I also want to have a prudent discussion with my team members who might have a bonus component, to be very frank, where we as lawyers always dance around when we want to give them some smart targets, smart objective setting, settings. And it might be very helpful to have colleagues or for me as a leader to be able to give them kind of a set. I'm, and I'm with Mark, not on not fully KPI vetted, because that's also nothing which I would go for, but at least a portion, a chunk based on a precise set of metrics where it's a fair discussion. Now, build on that if you think it through. If I have company KPIs, I can basically cascade them down to even the legal department. I can have a fair discussion as a legal leader, and that is very granular, which makes it easy for my leadership team reporting to me for myself to cascade it and then have KPIs. We can discuss, debate, continue, and what Mark said, focus, because these are obviously then also the priorities for the team. So my message is very precisely, KPIs are helping a lot to position a legal team, general counsel area in a broader organization. We need to speed up our thought process and the impulse giving here, uh, the starting point by this paper is something where all we should keep up pace to actually catch up with the business. And then the second one is it's the cultural change within the organization. It's heavily, utterly needed if you want to steer a team, a fair approach to metrics in the day-to-day -day business. Well, Sebastian, awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I uh, heard for the first time or liked your phrase of currency and management. KPIs, numbers are currency and management. You want to talk to management, you need to have these, this currency. Makes a lot of sense. Valerie, moving on to you. Um, welcome again. You are the head of the legislation division at the Central European Bank. You are also one of our co-authors of the new Springer Compendium book uh, coming out soon. Uh, called Humanization in the Law. You will contribute two articles, one of which is on knowledge management, which is actually, I think, a part of your responsibility at the Central European Bank. And that made me think uh, how you perceive the topic. Uh, uh, you know, you could look at it, uh, you know, as a, at KPIs and, and, and metrics as a measure for, 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 uh, for performance. And performance always has this eco economic ring to it, and, and you know, you're being measured and... Uh, and some people might object to the very term in, in, in sense like I'm being reduced to work like a machine or whatever. So uh, that's maybe one view, but it also you know, made me think that metrics and KPIs can be very valuable and important in what, what Sebastian just said in the cultural change that is about to happen. And, and uh, maybe in the topic of knowledge management in a broader sense, in a much wider sense than only looking at the economic performance aspects. So um, is, is that a way in which you perceive of, of KPIs and, and metrics or how do, how do you look at the topic? Thank you, Roger. Um, yeah, you raised many, many aspects. So maybe I will try to come at it from three angles to start with, two more general ones and one specifically on, on legal knowledge management. On the first angle, KPIs are only interested if we see the KPIs as quantitative signposting mechanism on the path to a qualitative outcome. So imagine you face a traffic jam or other deviation on a Saturday on your way to the wedding to your best friend, and you originally choose the shorter road kilometer wise in your GPS. Well, you keep going and take deviation, taking a longer road, because on the go, you adjust your quantitative KPI, which was to attend the ceremony on time using the shorter road. Now you revalue the qualitative dimension of the KPIs, which is to show you care for your best friend. So in the acronym KPI, the P stands for performance and KPI are more an art than a science. So allow me to borrow from the artistic field, uh, the connected term of performative, segue philosophical Jürgen Habermas. What we want with KPIs is to strive for a deliberate impact 
with our actions. So in that sense, the KPI are the script for acting with impact on the audience. It is instrumental in the decision making, reporting, communication cycles we all go through in our organization and institution. Second angle, legal department come into the KPI conversation in the third, if not fourth decade of existence of KPI as a steering tool. So outside the legal th field, the topic of KPI methodology is already at level 3.0, if not 4.0. It means the mistake have been done in many industries and we in legal, being late adopter, which sometimes has advantages, Sebastian, can cut through the fog, leaving aside all the illusion we had when we first worked with KPIs in general organizational management. One big illusion is that as with any new management and leadership fad, is taking KPI as a miracle pill to cut cost and multiply profit without effort like bread in the Bible. So my last angle is back on KPI and legal uh, knowledge management, and it's really to see legal knowledge management and to go continue the financial metaphor and the currency. I would add the, uh, the dimension of asset. I mean, in particular in our business, we, we look at our asset book uh, and, and their sustainability. And so the legal knowledge management is about asset management scattered over diversified portfolio often looking like UFOs. So for legal knowledge management, KPIs are meant to help sharpening the way we create taxonomies, inventories, search capability, ensure the, reliable, the reusability of legal knowledge and know-how assets. So if you are in the workshop of a carpenter who is orderly, you see all the drawers and wall filled with tools and each with a unique spot and a dedicated use. The more advanced the mastery of the carpenter, the more the order and specialization of each tool has an impact on his uh, qualitative outcome. But it starts with quantity, it starts with places, it starts with taxonomies, it starts with discipline and method. We lawyer practice an intellectual profession, so producing thoughts placed in digital documents so the legal knowledge asset are very dematerialized and it takes a lot of work to create usable metadata tag as well as possible. So textual unstructured data are more than just placed uh, somewhere in the black box of our document management system when we have one. KPIs can be really the pretext to have a conversation to professionalize the way we manage our legal knowledge assets to make sure that one deliverable can be reused multiple times, know how is shared and measured, and the institutional memory is uh, turned into valued asset and measured by the press of the button. Voila for now. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. <laughs> So, um, all right, with this, uh, it's open floor, but let me maybe stimulate, uh, give a little bit of a stimulation to the three of you. Um, it occurs to me we're, we're pretty much of the same opinion. Uh, we, we all well, have the same view on this. So let me ask this, how come that legal is so late to the party? If, if I mean, we can say the Liquid Legal Institute collects the, the forward thinking minds and okay, we're, but, but I, I just wanna give my thoughts on that. Uh, first, uh, it seems to me it wasn't really needed for the legal departments and maybe not even for the law firms that much, but the law firms kind of look at their lawyers and the, and the, and the uh, utilization rate. But at the end, the money was coming in and to the legal departments, the money was given. So uh, it seems maybe there wasn't that big of a need of it. And I was also wondering, forgive me, I'm not a lawyer, but I was also wondering if this thinking in numbers and distinct definitions is maybe a little bit contra to the legal mind because the legal mind, the legal profession is always about arguing and subsuming a concrete case under a general rule and then arguing with the opposing party who has a different subsumption. So maybe there's something intrinsic in a lawyer's mind against this kind of, uh, of, kind of numeric, mathematic, concrete thinking. And Mark, I see you raise your finger, please. Yes. Uh, well, about 100 years ago, when I was uh, a baby lawyer, 
um, there was this popular saying that went along these lines. Um, if, if you're good in um, English or, or whatever the language may be and speaking, um, then you become a lawyer. If you're good in math, you become a doctor or, or maybe an engineer. Okay, um, now that of course um, is a gross generalization, which sadly I think in the case of law has some application. Um, and it's a complete red herring because, um, you know, if law is ultimately, as I think it is, about persuasion, um, two things have to come about. Number one, uh, and this was something that um, Sebastian just absolutely nailed. Um, which was that, you know, you have to speak the language of business. Lawyers have for, forever been speaking the language of lawyers um, because they were self-regulated. They had very little financial accountability. Um, you know, they were left to their own devices. Um, but that's no longer the case because business now recognizes it's not just about, you know, the cost of, of legal services, which is certainly an issue, but you know, in terms of the larger corporate budget, it still remains a very small issue. But it's rather, you know, how can the legal, and this brings to this, my, uh, the second point, culture. Uh, culture is ultimately how a group um, identifies itself and what it thinks is important. Um, lawyers have always thought that, you know, impressing other lawyers with outstanding legal work is what's important. Uh, they are now learning in, in a digital world that what is important is what drives impact to their customers or clients. Um, that's what matters. And so when we're talking about data, we are using now for the first time and numbers they are not a substitute for professional judgment. They enhance professional judgment. And now we are beginning to use the lingua franca of business so that we can make our case much more persuasively to business. That's, I think, what, what's important here. Well put, Valerie and uh, Sebastian, Valerie and Mark, the three of you just, you don't need to raise your hand anymore. Have, let's have a free floating discussion. And if I have yeah, something yeah. important to say, I throw in. But Valerie first, because she did actually raise her hand and then Sebastian. <laughs> uh, two, two point, one looking backward. Um, I think that um, lawyers have been working in the lawyer echo chamber. I mean, Mark, you, you said it, but that's definitely working with data and working with other signage, uh, be it quantitative or using other tools and technology requires pluridisciplinarity. So I am a lawyer and we need to welcome and open our arms to the non-lawyer who are interested in the law business. And that leads me to my second point, which is more um, to now and the future which is technology shows that humans do not have any more the privilege of quality output. And uh, in a number of aspects, technology is a trigger. So not only profit, not only FTEs, and not only the usual organizational politics, but now we are shifting the conversation towards the hardcore deliverable of lawyers, be it contract management, be it procurement, be it uh, argumentation for litigation, technology is starting to compete with what was the privilege of the uh, soul of the lawyer with its words and so on. And I think this is for me the biggest trigger that we open up to technology and to data science. Sebastian, please. And 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 this is and this is adding Valerie and, and Mark and Roger. Obviously, so we were in our comfort zone, and it was quite cozy, and no one really wanted to get us out there because it was we had our lawyer's language. We can basically always hide behind our language. Now, our clients, users, have broader access to information. They 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 know tools where they can easy, and I'm not talking even like easy, not Google, but beyond legal advice. At the fingertip, and they and we compete now against them. Now, again, technology against swifter access to much more sophisticated legal output. 
That means also that the competition is coming. I need to get out of my comfort zone. The legal teams need to get out of their comfort zone and be measured against. And if I start to be measured against something, I need to have a more data-driven discussion within the teams. And to the cultural change, it's essential for self-marketing for our profession to jump on that train, to really jump on the train intrinsically because we are convinced or we should be convinced and also externally because the competition from technology, from swifter access is coming to us. So that's the reason, Roger, why we are a bit late Yeah, because yeah. we're in a very comfortable situation and uh, I guess many colleagues also feel that it, this pressure it's a bit the same discussion with KPIs, the next level of legal operations, where you wonder why it took so long for our profession to actually look into legal operations. When you talk to commercial people, they know their commercial excellence teams, which are basically driving the processes like ever since and, and giving them the KPIs they need to execute against. It took us ages. And this is the same discussion now. This is the next step. And I guess this is a bit of, of the three, what we just discussed is a bit the, the broader framing. We have the breath now in our neck and need to move yeah, rather swiftly. Um, to that point, uh, Sebastian, I, I, I completely agree with both everything that you and Valerie have said, which is a rarity for me uh, to agree with <laughs> everything that other panelists say. But um, I, I, would just, uh, I, I would just add this that um and this is to lawyers out there who may say oh well you know this is this is just not you know um, in keeping with the way i engage with practice in virtually every single jurisdiction i've come across around the world um there is a basic uh ethical compact that lawyers make when they become lawyers um that says that they are to competently and zealously and within the the contours of the legal system represent their uh, clients. I question how it is that a lawyer can competently, if not zealously, represent a digital, digitally mature client um, without um, doing these things. Um, you know, it's almost as if um, you know, the lawyer is or is 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 pretending to be the professor, but walking into a room where ever all of the students are at the advanced level and they are just at the beginner's level. Makes sense. So well, what I hear you say is uh, lawyers need to go with the kind of abilities and the sophistication of the business of their clients and digitalization is part of that client's world and you want to do what's good for them, you need to understand that context. It's essential. Mm -hmm. Valerie, please. I have a, an, um, uh, because I'm conscious of the time and there is something that I also want to kind of like uh, give as a perspective, which is the positive added value also in terms of work-life balance. We are known for being a profession because there is no end and corset to how much you can think there is, it's also extremely helpful. We wear some smart watches or whatever to kind of give us a sense of direction. So when it comes to work-life balance, when it's come to mental health, when it comes to well-being of lawyers, KPIs are not just there as a constraint on business for profit making. They have a much, much broader added value to the benefit of all. So we should not be impressed by the bureaucracy and the overhead in the process astutely presented by uh, uh, Bernard and, and Mike earlier, which is really methodologically extremely sound. But we also need to be aware that more of the same, if we continue to work the same way in a world that is ever faster and in an ever more VUCA world, KPIs for lawyers can be ring fencing the self abuse we are so talented at imposing on ourselves. So we need also to see the KPI from the humanization of our profession perspective. I just also wanted to not miss that important thought. It's a little bit defocusing, but I don't think it's a, a secondary aspect in the conversation. So, so let, let me rephrase if I understood you correctly, Valerie. You, what I heard you say is that let's also have metrics and KPIs on non-economic, non-business related aspects, but for example, also on work-life balance, on how people are feeling. Or did I misunderstand? I, I, 
I was not going so far because I don't think you can perform well-being and I don't think you can be instructed to be happy and instructed how to behave, but you can definitely through the metrics which are anonymous and which are not targeted at an individual, but which are more the collective performance of a team, you can see if there is some irregularity, if there is some uneven workload, if there is, but not to kind of like go against the individual on the very contrary, turn the KPI into a virtuous lever for a, a more sanity in and therefore seeing where we waste time, where we can improve our processes. And as a secondary effect of this improvement, of this measurement and improvement, the life, the work life balance of uh, the team member gets improved. So it's not targeting KPIs for well being, but using the aftermath of improvement done on the basis of the metrics to actually have that side positive effect. As a, as a Yes, that's the focus topic we mentioned, right? It, it's very, it actually ties to the focus because if you keep everyone focused, framed by KPI, so to say, then you end up in potentially having a bit more space for life, except for work, yes. so life. And that's the point with respect to have the KPIs or a mix of KPIs and other metrics probably, which are not that smart objectives with your people, but then they can focus on certain things, meaning when they have focus, they might have the chance to do something else rather than spinning all day in the in the wheel. Yeah, yeah I, I picked up on Barry's comment on work-life balance because it is related to another big topic that per currently we are pursuing at the LLI, which is uh, uh, lawyer well-being, as we labeled it. Now in the US, you certainly know that, Mark, there is uh, uh, there are studies showing that this profession is suffering to an unproportional degree from mental health problems. Interestingly enough, in Germany, you do not find that. Now, you may wonder, does that mean all German lawyers are healthier and happier than the American colleagues? Unlikely. What I think, what we think at the LLI, which is why we're going to bring out a new booklet and focus on that topic, we think it's even more tabooed and, and more kind of suppressed as a, as a potential problem here in, in Germany, at least, and probably in Europe, than in the US. So, so I think that's also an interesting aspect there. Mark, please. Yeah, um, you know, it, it, the, the um, data in the states is really troubling. Um, the legal profession um, is only slightly better than coal miners as ranking last in these categories. Alcoholism, drug abuse, depression, um, and, and more generally mental health issues, divorce, and suicide. Um, so clearly, I couldn't agree more, Valerie, that KPIs, which I think is a, there's a visceral reaction among so many lawyers, you just say the words KPI or you say the word numerical and they immediately say that doesn't apply to us. Uh, and of course, you know, the irony of the story is that, you know, these things, as you so I, I think astutely point out. Um, can actually work to lawyers' benefits. And that makes one other, one other related point. There have been multiple studies that say that where people, in, regardless of what they do, if they feel that they have a sense of purpose, they are going to perform better, they're going to be happier, and they're going to be healthier, okay? And so why is it, I'll bet you if you did a, a, a survey of lawyers and you asked them, um, do you have a sense of purpose? Is what you're doing most of the time what you envisioned you would be doing when you were a young idealistic student? If they're honest, I bet you the vast majority of them will say, very rarely do we have this sense of purpose. So all of these things, I couldn't agree more, could, could be turned around for our benefit. This is not a punishment, lawyers. This is this is something that is not only helpful to your customers, but it's ultimately helpful to you. And by the way, it will also give you a sense of purpose and elevate your importance within the larger organization. Awesome. It's more, more um, caring for money, for more meaning and sustainability. So the two M of KPI, money and meaning. Awesome statements. I'm looking at the watch. I know we have uh, 
Uh, we have a couple of minutes reserved or maybe five minutes reserved burnout for a call for action or uh, how much, I think Nina, you were going to do that at the end. How much time do you need? Uh, um, it, it will be a quick one, but we should not forget this because I really would like to invite the colleagues to the party. <laughs> okay, awesome. <laughs> so let's <laughs> maybe have, if I may, uh, may use a couple of more minutes and maybe Sebastian, I'll ask you, uh, because I think you brought it up, uh, self-marketing. So two statements. I have some 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 lawyer friends, not a lawyer, but when I talk to the member about being more client centric, they say we are client centric. If we're, if there's anything that I am, I'm client centric. But I think uh, there is this difference between between thinking in the client world and doing or th thinking about what the client told you and and immediately asks you to do. I think there's there's some bigger client. Uh, world that the lawyers need to understand it, but then you said you talk about self-marketing, uh, Sebastian, that the lawyers are not good at. Maybe you can make a comment on that. Do the KPIs and numbers, and will that not help us or help the lawyers, the legal departments, to to tell a story, to present themselves to their clients and to their bosses? We basically, uh, Roger, we basically we talk really basics. It's about listening in a conversation. If you want to be client-centric, you need to put that person in the center of your interest and you need to listen. Now, if you listen carefully and if we talk business language as a trusted business advisor, you and what does it really mean? You need to listen. And then they talk a lot about data, about real business data output, as we also had here, impact. But you, we need to have the ability to translate that back into our world. So what does it mean yeah. to my legal team, to my other areas? Yeah, if, uh, We've just running a responsibility program where we ask other functions to contribute. These people can come up with KPIs like this. Yeah, These are workshops. They're used to the metrics. They're used to the methods. And they come up with like non-legal people contributing. Meaning, I think that if you really want to be client-centric and want to be a business advisor, you need to listen carefully. These people will tell you what you need to, because I just sneaked into what the people are asking, give me some ideas of what a KPI look, should look like. And others are asking, now are the clients, the internal uh, uh, business people are also giving you input on KPIs? Of course. And that's what the team already introduced to us, that they're on the impact side, on the outcome side, you need, output side, you need to have their, their buy-in. now. And the vehicle is being client-centric, and the granular vehicle is talk their language. Don't hide behind our language. Listen carefully, and start. And that's the self-marketing point I'm always doing. It's like, guys, let's talk in your native German, whatever, uh, Italian, French, English. Start to talk usual, normal language, so that people can understand you. Let's stop hiding. And the next step is then to understand, <laughs> to understand them and then bring in the KPIs into that into that system. And then you already did so much uh, to pos position yourselves in a, a business organization, uh, because then it's 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 like people start to also come closer to us, listen carefully to our advice, more carefully to our advice, being more, more cautious about what we are telling them if we don't hide. Uh, so that's the self-marketing topic. And I would combine it always is like listening models, KPIs are being told to us, and you get the information you need to build a metric, and then you can provide. Uh, awesome, that's... awesome discussion. Loved it. Looking at the looking at the clock again. Thank you very much, Mark, Sebastian, and Valerie. It has been great. I would like to hand it over to one of the co-authors of the white paper, uh, Nina Stöckel, who's with us from Merck. And uh, Nina, just uh, maybe give us some some uh, ideas on how this topic could continue. Yeah, thanks a lot. And I, I, I really liked um, the statement from Mark uh, in the beginning. He said this is just a first step. And also it was much about um, that we might be late at the party, but there's still time to join. And this is really um, a call for action. I would like to invite uh, the colleagues to um, get in touch with us, um, make a proposal on how to create and, and use cases. There, I saw a lot of questions in the chat regarding use cases. There are some, but um, I think this 
this session was not just uh, long enough and, and substantial enough to, to really go into um, specific use cases. And if you're interested, this would really be the starting point um, for creating them um, together. And um, I think we can really um, yeah, benefit from the knowledge of, of all of you and the experience you had. And of course, we could also share, um, for example, we had some, some use cases um, in, in building our new contract management tool where we really showed um, the volume of certain contracts and just prioritized them in doing them by business service only before not having them in the system. We didn't even knew the number, the sheer number of these kind of um, agreements that have been processed. So this might be really um, the starting point. And yeah, what I would really like to um, invite you is join us um, and let's build meaningful use cases and drive this topic. And I think if we don't drive it by our own, we will be driven. I think this is what we heard and we really need to get uh, on top of the topic and yeah, be in the forefront of it. So um, yeah, happy to continue this um, excellent conversation. Awesome. Awesome. I got to say, I really enjoyed this. Uh, it's rare to hear so many participants also I got expressing themselves, him or herself, very lucidly and in an interesting way. It was a pleasure to listen to you and follow that discussion. Uh, and, and what Nina said, you know, continue in the topic, uh, maybe first step could be become a member of the LLI if you're not already are, because this is where things are happening. This is one of the topics that we do. We do many other things. We also end on time, not to waste your, your precious time. Take you seriously, guys. It was a pleasure. Hope to listen, hear you, see you soon again, and um, looking forward to the next call. Thank you.